Hello, everybody, and nice to be with you again. My name is Michael Millerman, millermanschool.com. In a recent video, we covered the introduction to Martin Heidegger's basic concepts. Hopefully you enjoyed that and got something out of it. I uh, thought we should just continue because that was pretty fun. So we're turning now to the first division, discussion of the is of beings as a whole. Those of you who don't have an interest in Heidegger probably won't get much out of this, but those of you who do, let's go through it and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So first division, discussion of the is of beings as a whole. Beings as a whole are actual, possible, necessary. Heidegger begins, let us follow the ancient saying. Now, a reminder, we heard this in the introduction, meleta to pan, basically take into care beings as a whole, as we'll see. Uh, take into care beings as a whole, Heidegger writes. And if we attempt to think the whole of beings at once, then we think roughly enough this, that the whole of beings is, in quotation marks, and we consider what it is, in quotation marks. Hello, everybody in the chat. Nice to be with you. We think the whole of beings, everything that is in its being. Okay, so someone's telling you, think about all being, all of being, all the beings. Okay, so we're taking the whole into our thought for a moment here. We think the whole of beings, everything that is, in its being. In doing so, Heidegger writes, we think at first something indeterminate and fleeting, and yet we also mean something for which we find nothing comparable, something singular. For the whole of beings does not occur twice, otherwise it wouldn't be what we mean. Okay, so far so good. Thinking the whole of beings, there aren't several wholes of beings, because then you could subsume that under something else. So we're thinking the whole of being, we're trying to, to what is, quote unquote, belongs not only the currently actual, which affects us in which we stumble upon, the happenings, the destinies and doings of man, nature in its regularity and catastrophes, the barely fathomable powers that are already present in all motives and aims, in all valuations and attitudes of belief. To what is belongs also the possible, Heidegger writes, which we expect, hope for, and fear, which we only anticipate, before which we recoil and do not yet let go. So if you're hoping for something, the thing you're hoping for is possible, it's not actual. To be sure, as Heidegger continues, the possible is not yet the actual. But this not actual is nevertheless no mere nullity. It's not pure nothingness. It's not pure non-existence. The possible also, quote unquote, is its being simply has another character than the actual. Different yet again from what happens to be actual and from the possible is the necessary. Thus, beings do not exhaust themselves in the actual. So Heidegger says, on the basis of that old statement, Melette Topin, think all beings. That doesn't just mean all actual beings, which is what you might have thought it meant. It includes possible beings and as well the necessary. To beings belong the wealth of the possible and the stringency of the necessary. The realm of beings, in other words, Heidegger writes here in summary, is not identical to the domain of the actual. In terms of number, but above all in terms of modality, you should know modality is like a technical philosophical term. The modalities are possibility, necessity, and actuality. So he's saying here all subsumed under uh, beings. In terms of number, but above all in terms of modality, we mean more than the actual when we say beings. Indeed, the actual is perhaps not at all the standard for beings. And whenever one demands closeness to the actual for human life, the actuality that is really meant is not what is simply present, but what is planned, not what is mastered, but an unspoken claim to power. Let me just take a step back here. You might have this chain of equivalences in your mind. Being is that which is real, and that which is real is that which is actual. Okay, something like that. Heidegger has to push us to see the possible and the necessary. These other modalities are included under being, and we shouldn't even take the actual as our standard. The actual is perhaps not at all, to repeat, the standard for beings. And whenever one demands closeness to the actual for human life, the actuality that is really meant is not what is simply present, what just happens to be there, 
my pen, my cup, my paper, but what is planned, okay? The oft mentioned actual is not the actual, but the possible. So the things that we think of as actual, Heidegger is saying, they have, they're rooted in our plans, in our projects, in what's possible. The oft mentioned actual is not the actual, but the possible. Thus, we never think beings as a whole, as long as we only mean the actual. Henceforth, if we earnestly think beings as a whole, if we think they're being completely, then the actuality of the actual is contained in being, but also the possibility of the possible and the necessity of the necessary. I'll finish this in a second, this first part of the first thing we're discussing, but again, to drive home the point, if I ask you, think about beings and you're tempted to think about the actually existing things, Heidegger says you're only getting part of the picture if you don't include the possible and the necessary. It remains to be asked why precisely these three, possibility, actuality, and necessity, belong to being, whether they alone exhaust its essence. For metaphysics, in brackets, ontology, it is clearly decided beforehand and without any consideration that these three types of being, also simply called the modalities, actuality, possibility, necessity, exhaust the essence of being. That a being is either actual, possible, or necessary strikes ordinary understanding as a truism. Now, whenever something about being, which is Heidegger's main concern, you'll probably get sick of hearing it unless you have a taste for it or unless you can, uh, how can you say it, acquire the taste for it. Heidegger is interested in being and what we say about it and what we think about it and our various relationships to it. And so he's telling us here that philosophers typically somehow automatically think being can be actual, necessary, or possible. And that seems self-evident, but it seems like a truism, but this is perhaps a misunderstanding of the other truism that beings are actual and the actual is the effective and what counts at any particular time. So you can already see he's going to be guarding against collapsing existence into actuality, being into actual. So that's the first numbered subsection of this first division. I'm going to continue because I just want to go through this with you, but uh, let me pause for a minute and once again say uh, good morning to you. Nice to be with you. Uh, good to see those of you who are here chatting, commenting. Feel free to, um, to continue with that and uh, like, subscribe, share, all of that. Let's continue to go through the text. Non-consideration of the essential distinction between being and beings is the name of Heidegger's next section here. What passes itself off as even more self-evident is just that beings are, okay? Here's my pen. My pen is pretty straightforward. Here's my, uh, you know, earbuds. They are, the case is, it's actual, it's there, it's real. Pretty straightforward. So it seems, right? What passes itself off as even more self-evident is just that beings are, or as we say, are determined by being. In other words, in what sense is the pen in, in existence? In what sense is it? Well, it is because it has being, is pushed forward by virtue of being, it shares in being. Okay, that's what Heidegger is saying. When we say beings are, we distinguish each time between beings and their being without noticing this distinction at all. This is key, without noticing. Heidegger, one of his strategies, one of his methods is he gets us to notice what we don't normally notice, but that which is present in the way that we speak or think. So we somehow take things for granted. We treat them as self-evident. We don't subject them to further analysis. And Heidegger believes that when we do so, we'll crack something open as something important that gives us insight into who we are and what being is. So to repeat, when we say beings are, we distinguish each time between beings and their being without noticing this distinction at all. Thus, we also do not ask what this distinction consists in from whence it originates how it remains so obvious and where it gets the right to this obviousness. Not everything that we regard as obvious has the right to obviousness. It can be perplexing, even though we don't treat it as such. We also do not find the slightest reason, Heidegger continues, to concern ourselves with this distinction between being and beings in the first place. If you have any interest in Heidegger and you've talked to people who don't, and you tell them, hey, have you ever thought about the distinction between being and beings, they don't necessarily drop what they're doing and give you their full attention unless they're being polite. 
we don't have apparently the slightest reason to concern ourselves with this distinction. When we consider the whole of beings, or even just attempt to think about it in a vague way, we leave what we envisage for the most part indeterminate and indistinct. Whether beings or being, or both of them alternately and indefinitely, or each separately but in a barely comprehended relation. Let me just give you the example here. The old passage is maleto topen, okay? Take into care all beings, all of being. So let's say, I tell you, imagine all beings. Then at first you imagined, I don't know, a collection of everything actual, so Heidegger said. Then he got, got us to expand beyond the actual to the possible and the necessary as also being. So now you have, okay, fine, everything, including the actual, the necessary, and the possible, the whole set, but you have the set of beings, but what about the being of the beings? Are you also thinking that? Is it the same? Is it in the set? Is it out of the set? Okay, this is he's moving you in this direction to consider the distinction between beings, even all of them, and their being. When we consider the whole of beings, or even just attempt to think about it in a vague way, we leave what we envisage for the most part indeterminate and indistinct, whether beings or being, or both of them alternately and indefinitely, or each separately but in a barely comprehended relation. From here originates an old confusion of speech. We say being and really mean beings. We talk about beings as such and mean at bottom being. The distinction between beings and being seems not to obtain at all. If it does obtain, ignoring it seems not to cause any particular harm. Again, like some people might say, oh, it's semantic hair splitting, it's mumbo jumbo. What are you even talking about? And yet Heidegger thinks it's important. Things take their course. However, we do not first hold ourselves within the above mentioned distinction between beings and being when we reflect upon the whole of beings and actually consider its being. Again, it's not the first thing we see. It's not somehow like crucial for us. That's always going to be of significance for Heidegger. Why isn't it? It seems like it ought to be. In fact, as he puts next, as he says next, the distinction between beings and being pervades all of our speaking about beings. Indeed, it pervades every comportment towards beings, whatever they might be, whether toward beings that we ourselves are not, stone, plant, animal, or beings that we ourselves are. So notice, there's a distinction. We don't often make it. But all of our speaking is saturated by it. And somehow, we ourselves are implicated in it. And yet, we don't pay much attention to it. It's very important. When we say, Heidegger continues, for example, completely outside scientific deliberation and far from all philosophical contemplation, the weather is fine. And then by weather, we mean something actual and existing. And we mean with fine the actual condition, and we mean with the inconspicuous is, the weather is fine, we mean with the is, the manner in which this being, the weather, thus and so exists. Hence, we mean the being of the being that is called weather. So look, take everybody said this a million times. The weather is fine. Okay. The weather is fine. The weather, that's the, he says this is how it normally is. We talk about the weather like it's a thing. And when we say the weather is, we, that means the weather, this being, is being in a certain way. It is being fine. Okay? Tricky, but think about it. Even in the sentence, the weather is fine, we have a distinction between beings, the weather, and somehow their being, the weather is fine. This is what Heidegger is saying. I'm just trying to explicate it for you as best as I can, okay? So we can follow along and see why he thinks all of this is important. Hence, we mean the being of the being that is called weather. The is does not thereby name a being, unlike the weather and fine. In other words, the weather is fine. We're naming the weather. We're naming the f weather's fineness. But then we have this is. He wants us to understand that. Conversely, the weather and fine name a being, unlike the is. The weather is determined by the warmth of the sun, by the radiation of the earth, and by its soil conditions, by wind, air current, by relative humidity, by the electrical conditions of the atmosphere, and more of the same. We can directly observe and with appropriate apparatus assess the weather and what is relevant to it. We can decide if the weather is good or bad or doubtful. 
What is good or bad or doubtful about the weather, we can see sense. But, uh, excuse me, we can encounter the weather and its condition. But wherein lies the is? Uh, okay. This is going to sound weird, but you have to stick with, uh, stick with Heidegger on this. What does it mean? What does it consist in that the weather is and that it is fine? The fine weather that we can be glad about, okay, but the is? What do we make of this is? The weather is fine. You know the weather. You like the fine. What about the is? You can't measure the is in the way that you can measure the weather. What are we to make of it? We can read from the hygrometer whether the air is more or less humid, but there are no instruments, as Heidegger writes, to measure and comprehend the is of what we mean by is. I hope you guys enjoy the little Bill Clinton uh, part of the thumbnail. Thus, we say with complete clumsiness, there are hydrometers, wind gauges, barometers that indicate how the weather is, but there are no is gauges, no instrument that could measure and take hold of the is. And yet we say the weather itself, namely, is thus and so. We always mean by this what a being is, whether it is in the way it is. We mean the being of beings. Remember, why is Heidegger, what's he doing here? Why is he talking about all of us? He's trying to get us to see that even in our ordinary speaking, the weather is fine. There's a distinction between beings and being. There's this distinction. Whether we pay attention to it or not, it's there in our simplest statements. Okay, so even though it's there in our simplest statements, we nevertheless, as he writes, attend only to particular beings as opposed to the distinction. In the case above, we're interested only in the weather conditions, only in the weather, but not in the is. Let me say something to this. So the, our speaking is permeated by the difference between beings and being. But because our interest is in beings, we overlook the distinction. Our interest is not in beings, so we don't pay attention to it. To repeat, we're interested only in the weather conditions, only in the weather, but not in the is. But what if we become interested in the is? Then we start paying attention. How many times a day do we use this inconspicuous word, is? And not only in relation to the weather, but what would come of our taking care of daily business if each time or even only one time we were to genuinely think of the is and allow ourselves to linger over it instead of immediately and exclusively involving ourselves with the respective beings that affect our intentions, our work, our amusements, our hopes and fears. Very clear point here, actually, if you think about it. The door is open means you know, either I'm happy that it is or I want you to close it. My coffee is cold. It means I want you to heat it up. My cup is empty. means I want you to fill it, right? My back is hurting. means I want you to whatever, right? Take care of it. In other words, our, our attention and our intention is always towards the beings. And if someone were to say the door is open, you were to say, is. Wow. Is. How do I even comprehend that you just said is? Well, your practical daily affairs would grind to a halt there, right? Um, and nevertheless, Heidegger wants your practical daily affairs to grind to a halt so that you can think for a little bit. We are familiar with what is beings themselves, and we experience that they are. But the is, where in all the world are we supposed to find it? Where are we supposed to look for something like this in the first place? Now, I know somebody's watching this saying, oh, it's just a way of speaking. It's just a function of grammar. It just comes with the language. Don't get hypnotized by the words. Well, Heidegger says, don't be so quick to dismiss it. Okay, don't be so quick to dismiss it as though it's self-evident right away what the being of language is, what it means that we're speaking beings. Yeah, okay, maybe fine, but don't be so quick. And we move on now, and he's going to give us some examples about the non-discoverability of the is. So here's the discoverability of my pen. Pretty simple. Discoverability of my coffee, which I'm going to pause and drink here for a minute. But where do you find the is? You might say you find it in speaking. Again, yes, uh, but don't be, so, don't be so quick to believe that we know the full significance of that. So I'm going to go over this section, the non-discoverability of the is. Let me pause for a minute, catch my breath, drink my coffee, say hello to everybody. We're going over, by the way, basic concepts, Martin Heidegger. I really like this book. I it's short enough that I just thought, let's present the introduction, which I did in a previous video. And we started, we might as well keep going. So good to see you. Uh, if you're enjoying this, please like the video, et cetera, et cetera. It's helpful uh, as I grow the channel and all of that. Okay, the non-discoverability of the is. Let's go on. The leaf is green. Heidegger writes, 
We find the green of the leaf in the leaf itself, but where is the is? We say, nevertheless, the leaf is, it itself the leaf. Consequently, the is must belong to the visible leaf itself, but we do not see, okay, okay. I'm gonna read this, but I also wanna help you understand it, okay? We do not see the is in the leaf, for it would have to be colored or spatially formed where and what is the is. Where in our experience of something are we given its being? You're given its shape, you're given its form, you're given its color, you're given, you know, given in perception. You, it's there for you somehow. But the being of the thing that's there for you, somehow it's not given in the same way as what it tastes like or smells like or looks like or, you see what I mean? So where does that, and by the way, this isn't merely conceptual. I always have to remind people when we're working on Heidegger, just test it for yourself. Look around, look at anything, ask yourself, from where are you deriving or getting or being given the isness of the thing that's there for you? The question remains strange enough. It seems, wouldn't you say, to lead to an empty hair splitting. A hair splitting about something that does not and need not trouble us. The cultivation of fruit trees takes its course without thinking about the is. Farmers don't need to be fundamental ontologists. And botany acquires information about the leaves of plants without otherwise knowing anything else about the is. In fact, my wife, I hope she won't mind me saying, microbiologist working on plants doesn't need to know fundamental ontology. It's not necessary. You don't need to ask about the is if you're just doing the operations of botany, of farming. It is enough that beings are, let's stay with beings, wanting to think about the is, is mere quibbling. Both times in quotation marks, the is there. Or instead, we intentionally steer clear of a simple answer to the question as to where the is can be found. Let's stay with the last example. How do you write? The leaf is green. Here we shall take the green leaf itself, the designated being as the object. Okay, just imagine. The leaf is green. The green leaf itself is your designated object. Now, insofar as the is is not discoverable in this object, you can't see the is under a microscope. You can't see it. It's just somehow there that it is. The is is not discoverable in the object. It must belong to, well, if it's not in the object, it must belong to the subject, in quotation marks. That means to the person who judges and asserts propositions. Each person can be regarded as a subject in relation to objects that they encounter. Object? Subject. Simple enough. Each person can be regarded as a subject in relation to the quote-unquote objects that they encounter, but how does it stand with the subjects of whom each can say I about itself? You can say I about yourself. I can say my, I about myself. Of whom many can say we about themselves. For example, we here now on this live stream. These subjects, quote unquote, are and must also be. To say that the is in the proposition, the leaf is green, lies in the subject, is only to defer the question. For the subject is also a being, and thus the same question repeats itself. Where are we deriving the isness from, is from? Indeed, it is perhaps still more difficult to say just to what extent being belongs to the subject, and belongs to it such that it would be transferred from here, so to speak, to objects. In other words, let me just, so that we don't get lost in me just reading Heidegger here, we must face the puzzle and the perplexity. Unless it strikes you as in some sense odd, it's gonna be difficult to make progress in understanding Heidegger. You have to just try to have it strike you as odd that, here I have two cups on my table. Here's a cup, green, full of water, etc. But that it is, Suddenly, again, the, the, to say that it is is different than to say that it's green. And if I'm not deriving the isness from the object, maybe I'm deriving it from the subject. But then Heidegger says, well, that's also not so obvious because what does it mean that you are? And what does it mean that you're transposing being from yourself to objects in the world? In other words, stick with the puzzle. We're not at any type of answer yet, okay? In addition, he continues, when we understand the green leaf as an object, quote unquote, we grasp it immediately and only in its relation to the subject and precisely not as an independent being that we address in the is and is green in order to articulate what pertains to the being itself. It's there for us. It's, we have a problem. The flight from the object to the subject is in many ways a questionable way out. Okay? 
Again, he's just telling us what's questionable so far about how we typically think about these things. Thus, we must reach still further and take notice for the first time of what we mean by the is. So this particular way of solving the problem, oh, we just say is not because the isness is in the cup, but because it's in us, that's not a solution. That just restates the problem. So therefore, to repeat, we must reach still further. With Heidegger, that's always the promise and the pleasure. He's going to take us further than we're used to going in understanding the constitution of this problem. We must reach still further and take notice for the first time of what we mean by the is. And we're going to do this in the next section called the unquestioned character of the is in its grammatical determination, emptiness and richness of meaning. And some of this, I think, is going to state what you guys are already thinking, like objections that you already have in mind. Heidegger is going to put into words for us here in a minute. Let me pause once more and just say very nicely uh, to you. Great to be with you. Thanks for being here. I hope that you enjoy this. You should know that there's another video I did prior to this one on the introduction to basic concepts. If you want to get uh, acquainted with that later so that you have it from the beginning, uh, just going through the chat here. Once again, great to be with everybody. And let's turn now to the unquestioned character of the is in its grammatical determination, emptiness and richness of meaning. When we take the is as a word, we label it, according to grammar, as a derivation and form of the verb to be, right? Is, are, am, was, etc. We can also elevate this verb into a noun, being. We can easily take notice of this grammatically determinable derivation, right? You say, oh, you're just talking about is, you're just talking about the word being, the verb, nominalizing it, making it being like a noun, we can easily take notice of all of that, but it contributes nothing to our understanding of what is named by the words to be, being, is, are, was, shall be, has been. Finally, we shall find out that no special assistance is needed in order to understand these words. We say the weather is fine. We can ask whether it really is fine and whether it will last or isn't already starting to change. There can be doubt as to the characteristics of this being, the weather, but not about the is. That is to say, not about what the is means here. Nobody's going to dispute. When I say the weather is fine, we don't need to dispute what we mean by is. We just mean, look, it's hot, it's cold, it's getting better, it's getting worse. It's apparent. Also, when it becomes questionable if the weather is good or bad, and we ask, is the weather really as bad as it looks from this corner, then the is itself remains entirely unquestioned in the question. I think we can all admit that, right? This is... It's, a lot of this is genuinely self-evident. There's nothing questionable about the is, about what we mean by it. But now here's the issue. How is it supposed to become questionable? How do you turn the self-evidence of the is in statements like the weather is fine, the door is open, the coffee is cold? How do you turn that is into questionable? How do you motivate even the problem? For indeed in the word is, Something is thought that has no special content, no determination. The weather is fine, the window is closed, the street is dark. Here we constantly meet with the same empty meaning. The fullness and variability of beings never comes from the is and from being, but from beings themselves. Weather, window, snow, bad, closed, dark. So in all of these sentences, the window is open, the weather is cold, the cat is sleeping. The richness seemingly comes from cat open, sleeping, door, it doesn't come from is. Is just functions as a little connector, right? So it seems, to repeat, the fullness and variability of beings never comes from the is and from being, but from beings themselves, whether window, snow, bad, closed, dark. When we say about beings that they are thus and so, open, closed, dark, etc., we might distinguish between beings and being, but in this distinction, being and the is remains continually indifferent and uniform for it is emptiness itself. Uh, in some cases, if you have questions and I see them in the chat, I'll be able to address them, okay? Just so, just so you know. Uh, indeed, perhaps we fall into a trap, so to speak, and attach to a linguistic form, which many of you might think Heidegger himself does, questions that have no support in what is actual. Useless hair splitting instead of investigating the actual. Okay, so Heidegger knows he's gonna have critics who say, my man, this is just a grammatical sign that functions to connect these things. It's got nothing in itself beyond that. Why are you wasting your time and talents? And why are you wasting our time and talents? Obviously, that's not the last word. 
Suppose we say, to stay with the weather, it rains. Here the is does not present itself at all. And yet we mean that something actually is. But what is the point of all this fuss over the empty little word is? The indeterminacy and emptiness of the word is is not eliminated by putting a noun in place of the is and pronouncing the name being. At best, it is even increased. It could appear that something important is concealed in what is named by the noun being, something important and in this case especially profound, even though the title being nevertheless remains just a name tag for emptiness. And yet, behind the uniformity and emptiness of the word is, a scarcely considered richness conceals itself. Okay, now we're getting closer to what Heidegger wants to deliver to us. We've examined here briefly in an everyday sense that is, is like, why do you care? Why is it trifling? It doesn't seem to add anything. It's enough for me just to talk about cat sleeping. I don't need to focus on the cat is sleeping. But behind the uniformity and emptiness of the word is, a scarcely considered means it shouldn't strike you as self-evident because we scarcely consider it. Richness, that should interest you, conceals itself. So we need to bring it out of concealment if possible. We'll see how Heidegger does that. We say, quote, This man is from Swabia. This book is yours. The enemy is in retreat. Red is port. God is there is a flood in China. The goblet is silver. The soldier is on the battlefield. The potato beetle is in the fields. The lecture is in room five. The dog is in the garden. The man is the devil's own. Above all summits is rest. Each time, the is has a different meaning and import for speech. We do not want to avoid this complexity but rather to emphasize it. For such a survey of the obvious can serve as a preliminary exercise for something else. Pause. So we had examples, the window, the door, the dog, etc., And it seemed like the is adds nothing. Now Heidegger says the is adds something. And how's he going to show us? He's given us several examples, several statements. And in a moment, he's going to go over those statements and show how the is differs in each case and contributes something in each case. That's going to be a correction or a refutation, let's go with correction, of our earlier view that the is adds nothing. So in a, mo in a moment, we're now going to have Heidegger go over each of those statements. There's a flood in China, the gob goblet is silver, and explain how, how the is functions differently in each of them. Again, those of you who are just tuning in, going over parts of Heidegger's basic concepts lecture. So he's given us these various sentences. Now let's see what he says about how the is functions in them. The man is from Swabia says he originates from there. The book is yours says it belongs to you. The enemy is in retreat means he has begun to withdraw. Red is port means the red color is a sign for. God is, is supposed to mean God exists. He's actually there. There's a flood in China means there something prevails, spreads, and results in destruction. The goblet is silver means according to its material characteristics, it consists of dot dot dot. The soldier is on the battlefield would say he engages the enemy. The potato beetle is in the fields, establishes that the animal causes damage there. It's not just that it is there. The potato beetle is in the fields means it's causing damage there. The lecture is in room five means the lecture takes place there. The dog is in the garden means to say the dog is located there, runs around there. This man is the devil's own means he acts as if possessed by evil. And then you have this line of poetry, above all summits is rest means, and here Heidegger pauses, yes, what does this mean? Above all summits, rest locates itself or takes place, exists, spreads. 
Above all summits is rest. Here, not one of the above mentioned elucidations of the is fits. And when we collect them together and add them up, their sum does not suffice either. Indeed, no paraphrase at all will do. We simply have to leave the is to itself in that phrase, above all summits is rest. And thus, the same is remains, but simple and irreplaceable at once. The same is enunciated in those few words that Goethe wrote upon the mullions in a hut on the Kikkelhan at Ilmenau. I guess it's from a letter that he wrote to someone, above all summits is rest, okay? A line of um, Goethe. How strange that in response to Goethe's word, above all summits is rest, we vacillate over an attempted elucidation of the familiar is and hesitate to give any elucidation at all so that we come to give up completely and say only the same words over and again, above all summits is rest. So we started with the apparent emptiness of the is, the door is open, the weather is fine, then we saw the differentiation in these various sentences, like the soldier is on the battlefield, the book is yours. And then we come to a sentence or a phrase, above all summits is rest, where you can't even offer a paraphrase. All you can do is just say it again. Above all summits is rest. We forego an elucidation of the is, not because its understanding could be too complicated, too difficult, even hopeless, but because here the is, always in quotation marks, um, is said as if for the first and only time. It can't be paraphrased to say something else. This is something so unique and simple that we don't have to do anything on our part to be addressed by it. Hence the intelligibility, quotation marks, okay, the intelligibility of the is that precludes all elucidation, the intelligibility that has perhaps a completely different mode than the familiarity in which the is otherwise occurs to us constantly unthought in everyday discourse. Let me now elaborate. Heidegger is putting his fingers on the fact that sometimes this word is, which again seems like useless hair splitting, like some sort of a grammatical game, mental masturbation, some people say, in other words, trifling, it actually reaches us with different modes of intelligibility. And the fact that we are always operating within the distinction between beings and being, and the fact that the is can strike us in different modes of intelligibility makes us think there could be something there, which is why he's going through this exercise. There could be something there about where we stand and how the world is for us and all of that. So, uh, separately from the way it is in our everyday discourse, when it is constantly unthought. All the same, the simple is of Goethe's poem holds itself far away from the mere indeterminacy and emptiness that we indeed easily master. So we had the one version of the is, which is this just empty, indeterminate connector type thing. But that's not the way it is here when he says, above all summits is rest. Heidegger's trying to get us to see. Uh, here on the contrary, and despite its intelligibility, we are not at all equal to the address of this word, but are admitted into something inexhaustible, called forth into something that we can't master. Above all summits is rest. In this is speaks the uniqueness of a gathered wealth, not the emptiness of the indeterminate, but the fullness of the overdetermined prevents an immediate delimitation and interpretation of the is. If we can't grasp it, it's not because there's nothing there. It's because it's like trying to grasp the ocean in a cup. The insignificant word is thus begins to shine brightly. This is the goal in some sense of Heidegger's lecture is to get this automatically indeterminate, empty, seemingly nothing word to shine brightly for us. The insignificant word is thus begins to shine brightly and the hasty judgment about the insignificance of the is starts to waver. We now recognize the wealth of what the is has to say because we just saw it can say many different things, including up to the unsayable. Okay, above all summits is rest. Something, it can point beyond itself in such a profound way. We now recognize the wealth of what the is has to say and is capable of saying only in different respects from the complexity of the enumerated propositions. The soldier is on the battlefield, etc. 
If we attempt to transfer the meaning of the is from any one of the above cited propositions to the others, we immediately fail. So it can't be transposed in all of its uses. It's distinct and meaningful in these different ways. Thus, the emptiness and uniformity of the is, which was our starting point, sort of the belief or the hunch that it's empty and uniform, shows itself, upon analysis, to be a clumsy pretense that clings to the sameness of the sounds. The door is open. The dog is sleeping. If I always hear the word is, it must always mean the same thing. No, that's a clums clumsy pretense that clings to the sameness of the sounds and the written characters. But how then, Heidegger continues, is the alleged wealth supposed to lie in the is itself? So it's not uniform, it's not flat, it's not empty, it's wealthy, it's differentiated, but how? How is the alleged wealth supposed to lie in the is itself? The word is, taken by itself, remains helpless and poor in meaning. Why it is so with the is, Indeed, why it must be so is also easy to see. The complexity of the meanings of the is has its intelligible ground in the fact, as you can see, I think, that a different being is represented each time in the above cited propositions. The man from Swabia, the book, the enemy, the color red, God, the flood, the goblet, the soldier, the potato beetle, the lecture, the dog, the evil man. And finally, in Goethe's poem, what? Rest? Remember, above all summits is rest, excuse me, rest is, right? Above all summits, uh, don't wanna mess up the order there. Above all summits is rest. Okay, so the soldiers in the field, the soldiers, the one of the beings that we're talking about, but what about rest? Is rest represented there and something about it ascertained that it is present above all summits? You see what I mean? When Heidegger says above all, when Heidegger quoting Goethe says, above all summits is rest, to say that rest is, is different than saying that a dog is. Is rest one of the beings? Here again, we hesitate over the interpretation. And that is no wonder, since the propositions cited above are prosaic, quote unquote, observations and declarations, the light is on, the door is open, while in the last example, above all summits is rest, precisely a poetic proposition was brought forward. In poetic propositions, if they may be called propositions at all, Things do not lie on the surface as much as they do in familiar everyday discourse. The poetic is the exception. The rule and the ordinary are not to be gathered from it, and that means that whatever can be discerned of the is commonly and in general. So in other words, it should not strike us as strange that it's harder to make sense of the role of the is in Goethe's sentence because there it's used poetically, or it's in a poetic assertion. Therefore, Heidegger continues, we may hope to ascend to the level of higher poetic expression, and to be able to attempt its clarification only when the meaning of the is is first clarified satisfactorily in the common assertive proposition. So before we leap to the poetic significance, we have to know how it functions in the ordinary significance. Thus, it is perhaps just as well that we do not allow ourselves to be prematurely confused by the poetic example that was merely tacked on to the end of the propositional sequence. The previously cited propositions suffice then to demonstrate that the is derives its meaning each time from the being that is respectively represented, addressed and articulated in the proposition. The soldier is on the front. The dog is sleeping. Okay, the book is mine. Only thus can it fill the emptiness that is otherwise and indeed characteristically inherent in it from case to case and present itself in the appearance of a fulfilled word. So we went from the emptiness of the is to its multi-fold richness through those various examples. But then we ask, where does it get its wealth and richness from? And the first answer is it gets it from the beings that it's linked to. The richness, it's not flat, empty, and indeterminate. It's variegated, but the variation comes from the variability of the beings. True, Goethe's line casts some doubt on that because we don't know how it functions there, but because that's a poetic assertion, we can sort of put it off to the side for a moment. That's where Heidegger is so far in his exposition. So once again, going over more of this basic concepts uh, lecture, because why not? It's a nice opportunity to discuss Heidegger with you. I hope you're getting something out of it. And uh, I'm gonna pause here for just a second and then we're gonna continue. I don't really know how much of this we'll do uh, together on the live stream, but I'm not ready to stop yet. Thank you for joining. The emptiness and indeterminacy of the is, 
as a presupposition for its being a copula. We continue. Citing the examples above thus proves the exact opposite of what is supposed to be shown. Not a richness of the is, but precisely its emptiness, right? If the richness of the is that we thought we discovered gets all of its richness from the beings that it's talking about, soldiers, dogs, cats, windows, and the weather, then in fact, it's not rich. It is empty. It's just a mirror somehow. You know, it derives its wealth from whatever you associate with it. Well, that's not such a big deal, is it? Hence, the impression afforded at first by this much used word is confirmed. See the dialectic of Heidegger's argument so far? I.e. that of an indeterminate and not further determinable word, which is the essential mode of this word. Indeed, the alleged emptiness of this word, the is, can be properly demonstrated as soon as we cease to deal with it in an approximate way. Let us attend to the character of the word instead of the many examples of its application, which can easily be multiplied to infinity, right? You can have infinite number of sentences. The pen is full of ink, the cup is empty, etc., etc. So let's stop with the examples Heidegger says and approach it in a different way. Namely, to the character of the word, which we get through grammar. And some of you will already have made this objection. According to grammar, the is has the task of connecting the subject with the predicate. The is is therefore called the link or copula. Okay, by the way, even though Heidegger has discussed this issue, there are many people who read him and still say, oh yeah, Heidegger just doesn't know that is is a grammatical, you know, copula. My, my friends, he's discussing that right now. He's going to tell us right now why in his view that's not an adequate objection to his uh, considerations here. The connecting remains dependent on what is supposed to be connected. When we use the is as a copula, the car is red. And the mode of the bond is determined by the mode of what is supposed to come into connection. Thing, car, color, red. That the is has the character of the copula, connector, linker, shows clearly enough the extent to which its meaning must be characterized by emptiness and indeterminacy. For only thus can the is suffice for the various uses that are constantly demanded of it in discourse. Is could only link car, color, person, activity, X, Y, if it was itself indeterminate and empty. That gives it the flexibility to operate as a copula. Heidegger is saying. He's stating this and then he's going to overcome the objection. For only thus can is suffice for the various uses that are constantly demanded of it in discourse. The is remains not only actually an empty word, but due to its essence as a connecting word, copula linker, it may not be loaded down beforehand with any particular meaning. Its own meaning must therefore be totally empty, right? Couldn't use it to connect X and Y if it already colored the connection by virtue of some characteristic that itself it brought to the equation. Okay, let me just show you where we are. We're now going into this next highlighted section. Being is as the general, the universal. I know this is obscure, I know this is opaque, I know this is difficult, but I believe very strongly that it's comprehensible. Heidegger is not deliberately obscurantist. He gives us very clear access to these issues, if only we have the patience to work through them. And I uh, enjoy talking about it with you. So, being is as the general of the universal. Let's see here. The uniformity of the is, therefore, cannot be passed off as a mere appearance. It distinguishes this word and thus indicates that the noun being, derived from its infinitive to be, also only signifies perhaps a perhaps indispensable but fundamentally empty representation. I uh, see in the comments, my philosophy lectures are a bit dry and lack the passion of my geopolitical readings. Um, the uniformity is won by turning our view from beings and their respective determinations and retaining only the empty universal. So you've seen the back and forth, right? It's empty. Then we had the examples. It's full. Its fullness is derived from the objects, but that only shows you that it's a copula. That only shows you that it's empty. That's where we've gone so far. And if the is is empty, then being must also be empty since being is just the nominalization of the verb. This uniformity is won by turning our view from beings and their respective determinations and retaining only the empty universal. For a long time now, being has therefore been called the most common, the general, the most general of all that is general. In this word, being, and in what it means, the solidity of each respective being evaporates into the haziest haze of the most universal. Hence, Nietzsche calls being the last breath of a vaporizing reality. 
If, however, being thus vaporizes and disappears, what becomes of the difference between being and beings? If you remember, that's where we started. We had this difference between being and beings that saturates our speaking, but doesn't usually command our attention and our thinking. But then you have the evaporation of being as the most empty universality. What happens to the distinction between being and beings in that case? In this difference, Heidegger writes, we have before us two differentia. Beings, look around you, okay? Cup, pencil, paper, whatever, computer. Beings and being. If, however, one of the two differentia in this difference, namely being, is only the emptiest universalization of the other, remember, empty, it owes its essence to the other, gets all of its richness and wealth from the other, and if consequently everything that has content and endures shifts to the side of beings, that's where you get all the richness from, and being is in truth nothing, or at best an empty word sound, okay, everything that we've sort of walked through so far, then the differentiation between being and beings may not be taken as completely valid, for it to be valid, each of the two sides would have to be able to maintain a genuine and radical claim to essence from out of itself. If we are to consider the whole of beings, then we could certainly give the most universal but also the emptiest of beings the name being. I'll, I'll walk you through this if you're not following, don't worry. But we fall at once into error when, fooled by the naming and establishing of the name being, we chase after a so-called being itself instead of considering only beings. Indeed, we do not simply fall once more into error, but into the mere emptiness of the purely null, right? Oh, this is word games. This is, uh, you're just being tricked. You're being hypnotized into thinking that being is something, whereas it's just this empty word, this empty connector. Okay, that's falling not only into error, but into the mere emptiness of the purely null. We're not even talking about anything. Where inquiry no longer finds any support, where there's nothing to be in error about. Okay, Heidegger is very clear about how this might seem to people and why it might seem that way that he's talking about nothing hair splitting emptiness okay if we want to follow the saying the old greek saying meleta to pan which we're doing meleta take take into care to pan the whole pan like panopticon they everything that's what Heidegger is gradually working us through here if we want to follow the saying meleta to pan we would do well to avoid the phantom of an abstract concept named by the word being. Let me pause here for a minute and again, just recapitulate and walk you through what he's said. I think it's helpful to do these little recapitulations. He also does them. We have this phrase, take into being, take into care or consideration, beings as a whole, pen. We saw beings as a whole doesn't just mean the actually existing things because it includes actual necessary and possible. That was our first expansion. We expanded the set of beings beyond the actual to include the possible and the necessary. Then we said, well, in all of our experiences of beings, it seems like two things come together, the being and its being. Okay, somehow this ontological difference between beings and being. So we had to kind of include that as well if we're taking every thing into consideration. But then we had the question, when we put being into our set, when we have this difference between being and beings, is being really anything or are we just talking about nothing? Is this empty indeterminate word that we're just slapping on as a copula to connect things, but really it's not adding anything to the picture. It has no richness, no wealth, no substantiality. It puts nothing on the table. Therefore, even though we thought we needed to have this distinction between beings and being, even though we thought that it permeated our language and could be insightful if we turn our attention towards it, it seems like we could just as easily take it away since it's not adding anything. It's not doing anything. It's total empty formality, so to speak. Abstract concept. That's where we've landed so far. Now, Heidegger continues. The solution of healthy common sense acting and affecting among beings instead of empty thinking about being. And then in parentheses, workers and soldiers. In other words, don't just be a hair-splitting philosopher dealing with your empty abstract concepts, oblivious of the way that language operates, hypnotized into believing that being is something and wasting all of our time with it. Go be active 
effective fight, work, workers and soldiers acting and affecting among beings instead of empty thinking about being. Continuing. But an alert sense for the actual and a healthy instinct for realities, quote unquote, do not need such far-ranging reflections. These are already abstract enough, and additionally, they attempt to demonstrate the emptiness and groundlessness of the abstract. A forthright man experiences the whole of beings not through dislocations of empty thinking about being, like we've been doing and following Heidegger, but only by acting and affecting among beings. Of course, not every random activity guarantees a coalescence with the actual and thus the concrete in distinction from the abstract. So if you're not going to be like the abstract hair splitting philosophers, you want to be on the side of actuality. Well, what kind of activities are going to put you in touch with actuality, reality, and the concrete? Well, here Heidegger continues expressing this position. For this, participation in the inner law of the age is needed. But where this participation occurs, there awakens a heightened knowledge, which is delivered over to something necessary, and that means indispensable for it. Therein lies an authentic concept of being free and freedom articulated by Nietzsche, with reference here to Twilight of the Idols. But who would deny that active participation in the actual takes place in various levels of knowing and acting, and must do so completely for an age in which the will to power alone everywhere determines the fundamental characteristic of acting and even rules over the most apparently opposed standpoints so that nothing more remains of the previous world. In other words, we live in an era in which beings and the whole is determined as will to power where you need actuality, effectiveness, doing something, willing, gaining, dominating, or being dominated, oppressing or being oppressed, affecting or being affected, okay? Not just hair splitting conceptual operations. And who would deny that in this age of the will to power, active participation is really the name of the game here. Who would deny that all human planning and affecting displays in particular clarity the character of a great game in which no individual nor even everyone together can muster the stakes at risk in this world play, quote unquote. Who could wonder that in such a time, our time or Heidegger's time, when the world as we have known it is coming out of joint, the thought arises that now only the love of danger and adventure can be the way man secures the actual for himself. So in rejecting the hair-splitting, abstract, conceptualizing of the philosophical and seeking instead the actual, Heidegger says, who could doubt that in our time the way you seek the actual is through love of danger and adventure? You have examples, by the way, of this. I don't have to name names. There are high-profile, well-known figures uh, that you can think about today who embody the view that you must reject the conceptual, embrace the actual, and that the road to the actual is love of danger and quote-unquote adventure. Nietzsche says, every higher man feels himself to be an adventurer. In any case, it becomes clear that all interpretations of humanity and its determination, issuing from previous explanations of the world, lag behind what is. We're in the age where what's real is what's uh, disclosed to the adventurer. In the meantime, it has been decided that the worker and the soldier completely determine the face of the actual, all political systems in the narrow sense, notwithstanding. These names are not meant here as names for a social class or profession. So he's not talking about the profession of the worker, the social class or the profession of the soldier. They indicate in a unique fusion the type of humanity taken as measure by the present world convulsion for its fulfillment that gives direction and foundation to one's relation to beings. The names worker and soldier are thus metaphysical titles and names, excuse me, metaphysical titles, and name that form of the human fulfillment of the being of beings now become manifest, which Nietzsche presciently grasped as the will to power. If the world is will to power, the world is disclosed by workers and soldiers as metaphysical types. 
This emerging formation of humanity, and by the way, workers and soldiers, therefore, as those who are seeking the, uh, the, the actual, and then we're doing so through act, effect, adventure, okay, love of danger, not hair splitting, not contemplation, not abstract thinking about the is. Remember, Heidegger's given us the, the, in the dialectic of his argument, we've snapped from a consideration with the meaning of being to the embrace of the actual through the soldier and the worker as a function of Nietzsche's penetrating insight into the world as will to power. This emerging formation of humanity was already clear to Nietzsche in the 80s of the last century, 1880s, not from observations of social and political conditions. It's not like he looked around and saw what the political parties were doing and said, oh, hey, this is the world of the will to power. But from metaphysical knowledge about the self-fulfilling and long-decided essential form of being as will to power. In other words, even the rejection of the understanding of being as too abstract and for philosophical eggheads, and therefore the snap back into the world of the soldier and the worker, itself reflects a certain understanding of being as will to power, which Nietzsche expressed most clearly. Three sketches from the decade between 1880 and 1890 might suffice to prove this, Heidegger continues. We must forego a more exact interpretation here. Uh, interesting comment that Heidegger's words feel like a robotic computer. I've got the exact opposite. They're the kind of words that undo our robotic computation when it comes to thinking about being. But again, it takes it takes something, I think, to get onto his wavelength. I do what I can in my comments to try to uh, open that up, but uh, maybe not always so effectively. In 1882, Nietzsche writes in The Will to Power, the workers shall live one day as the bourgeoisie do now, but above them, distinguished by their freedom from wants, the higher caste, thus poorer and simpler, but in possession of power. In 1885-86, Nietzsche writes in The Will to Power, modern socialism wants to create the secular counterpart to Jesuitism, everyone a perfect instrument, but the purpose, the wherefore, has not yet been found. In November 1887, uh, March 1888, Nietzsche writes in The Will to Power, from the future of the worker, workers should feel to learn like soldiers, an honorarium and income, but no pay, no relation between payment and achievement, but to place the individual, each according to his kind, so that he can achieve the highest that lies within his realm. In these sketches, Heidegger continues, by Nietzsche, the names worker, soldier, and socialism are already titles for the leading representatives of the main forms in which the will to power will be enacted. In other words, Heidegger's view is that Nietzsche foresaw that we're entering a configuration of the world in which worker, soldier, and socialism are how being is uh, disclosed, how being is configured, namely as actual. Workers and soldiers, therefore, Heidegger continues, open the gates to the actual. At the same time, they execute a transformation of human production in its basic structure of what formerly was called culture. The latter, according to previous notions, is an instrument of cultural politics. Oh, we're entering something here because Heidegger has reflections on culture and cultural politics that I think are very relevant for the way we think about the quote-unquote culture war, for example. But let's not get too sidetracked. Culture only exists insofar as it is plugged into the operations that secure a basis for a form of domination. Um, let me just say something about this for those of you who saw the first live stream on the introductory part of this book. When Heidegger said we want to have a return to the Greek inception, we need to think about the Greek origin of our history and of our future. And remember he said, we don't want to return to it as like a cultural artifact. We're not treating the Greeks as like a museum piece or a nice statue that you can put by your pool or whatever the case is. We're trying to enter into what's essential. Well, in a different way, when you're not entering into what's essential, you can treat in, in Heidegger culture is kind of like a bad word because culture means this calculating approach that's used for utilitarian purposes as opposed to a breakthrough into the realm of the essential. So here, culture and cultural politics is the same thing, right? Imagine, I'll give you a very vulgar example that may or may not map on, but imagine I'm like using my Bible for cultural politics. I've never even read it. I can just use it in, you know, like a whatever, right? Like a rake or like a broom, or like a fly swatter, it becomes, I'm using it for my cultural politics, but I may not have any 
breakthrough to the essential uh, meaning or understanding or piety or faith or law or revelation, okay? Cultural politics. Culture only exists insofar as it's plugged into the operations that secure a basis for a form of domination. If the world is will to power, culture is an instrument for domination. I'm getting into this. Okay, I hope you guys are enjoying this. Uh, that we use the term plug in to name this connection, an expression from machine technology and machine utilization, is like an automatic proof of the actuality that find words here. In other words, that finds word here. Heidegger is saying, the world as will to power is a machine world of domination, actuality, effectiveness, okay, the instruments grinding along, and culture becomes, again, very much like plug in, okay? The idea of getting plugged into something is a, from the language of machine utilization, machine technology, and it shows you that machine thinking has permeated our way of being in the world. Workers and soldiers remain obviously conventional names that nevertheless can signify roughly and an outline the humanity now arising upon the earth. In other words, it's not a humanity of poets and philosophers. It's not a humanity of the holy and the priests. It's a humanity of workers and soldiers, Heidegger is saying, okay, as types, the human type that matches the age. If the peasant transforms himself into a worker in the provisions industry, then this is the same process by which a leading scholar becomes the managing director of a research institute. Okay, everything becomes organized, uh, technologized. But it would be backward and only half serious, thus not at all seriously thought out, to try to characterize these events in terms of past political ideas, for example, as proletarianization, and to believe, thereby, that we had grasped the slightest thing. Guys, I'm going to finish reading this section, and then I'm going to, again, zoom out and tell us why we're talking about this in the context of the rest of Heidegger's argument so far. Only a, uh, where am I here? To interpret everything from what has been and thus to exclude oneself from the realm of the already actual and its essential being corresponds to natural human inertia. Only a dreamer and a visionary could want to deny that in the age dawning upon the earth, man experiences real beings as a worker and soldier does and makes available what alone is to count as a being. Remember, that's what we're talking about. We were digging into the meaning of the is, we rejected it in this dialectical argument as not concrete. And we see that in the age that Heidegger is writing about, what's concrete, if you take what exists as what's concrete, what's concrete is a function here of all of this, the worker, the soldier, the mechanical uh, machine utilization and so on. Only those who are permanently ill-tempered and angry on principle could propose to stay essential decisions by flight into what has been, to whose past formation and preservation they've contributed nothing. Yet genuine participation in the law of the age, remember Heidegger has this sense that our age is characterized by a certain way of configuring the meaning of being. Nietzsche put his finger on it when he configured the meaning of being as will to power. Something like that, roughly, okay? Yet genuine participation in the law of the age is also essentially other than the comportment that exhausts itself in advocating optimism. For mere optimism is only a concealed pessimism, a pessimism that avoids itself. In this age of the convulsion of the entire world, pessimism and optimism remain in the same way, powerless for what is necessary. The sobriety of knowing and reflection upon what is are necessary above all. However, this sobriety includes recognizing the truth under which the history of the age stands, the truth that we live in the age of the will to power. Sobriety also includes asking, by the way, no optimism about it, no pessimism about it. We live in the age of the world of power. Sobriety also includes asking whether the uniqueness of this world age demands of Dasein, of you understood in your openness to being, you understood in your existence, okay? The existential rootedness of man. Sobriety includes asking whether the uniqueness of this world age demands of Dasein and originality for which having intellectual interests and attending to so-called cultural concerns in addition to the life of action do not suffice. In other words, you can't just go to conferences. You can't just discuss the latest news. The world as will to power makes certain demands on human existence at a deep and foundational level that aren't dealt with superficially, including the superficial, superficial research institutes and uh, academic conferences cultural concerns, okay? A museum of Greek antiquity. 
For the genuine passion of sobriety, the best optimism is too lame, every pessimism too blind. All this should indicate that the call to participate in the actual always stands under a different law. It does not each time guarantee a straightforward experience of what is. Certainly today, workers and soldiers experience beings in helping to bring about their characteristic features. Just say a word about that. Okay, we're not done. The section, I know this is long. I know it's obscure. Whatever. I want to keep going. But let me just take a, take a step back here. I can do another recapitulation. In this section, you're rejecting the egghead, abstract, conceptualizing, hair-splitting, good-for-nothing philosophers who are thinking about being because access to being is through action, effective action. That's what it might seem like. Heidegger's view is that Nietzsche had insight into the world behind that hunch, the world as will to power. In the world as will to power, the new type of man who has privileged access to what is, is not the poet, the priest, the philosopher, the holy man, but rather the soldier, the worker, the daring adventurer. Okay, I won't say anything about the pirate, won't say anything about these other potential figures, but okay, the soldier, the worker has privileged access to what is. But we see that they think they have privileged access into the way the world is, but they also don't see the shape of the world as will to power. They're shaped by the world as will to power. So there's something missing even from the actuality of the soldier and the worker, something actual that they're not seeing in their action and uh, daring and adventure, namely the shape of the age as will to power, which seemingly is disclosed only to the hair splitting, egghead, abstract, over conceptualizing uh, philosopher. All right, hopefully that was a bit of a clarification. So let me just see where we stand because this is uh, this is taking some time, but let's do, well, we're one section away from Heidegger's recapitulation. So let's just do this section and then figure out what's next. I might stop, where, where are we at here? Hour and something. Uh, by the way, if you're enjoying this or other content on the channel, please like, subscribe, share, etc. Renouncing being, dealing with beings. Do workers and soldiers, Heidegger continues, in virtue of this experience, also know the being of beings? Well, we just saw and just said that they don't because they don't know the world is will to power. Um, well, okay, no. Yet perhaps they no longer need to know it. Perhaps the being of beings has never been experienced by those who directly shape, produce, and represent beings. Perhaps being was always brought to knowledge merely by the way, like something apparently superfluous. You don't need ontology to be effective in the world. You could found a country, you could conquer a country, you could destroy a country, you could found a business, you could do all of this stuff without ontology. So they don't know it, and they don't need to know it, maybe. If it were so, then within the realm of historical humanity, besides the boundless complexity and fullness of beings, this superfluity being would still reveal itself. Then it would remain to ask whether this superfluity is also the gift of a surplus and a wealth, or whether it always remains useless, the poverty of an emptiness, the emptiness that already announced itself to us distinctly enough in the connecting word is. In other words, you have the actual, you have the effective, you have the soldiers, you have the warriors, but you also have being, and now we have this question, is being, after all, this empty nothingness, this sort of uh, adds nothing, or is this something added like a gift, added like it has enriched everything that we can say about beings and everything that we can do with beings. Without noticing it, we are, we are again considering the difference between beings and being. We don't know. That difference is always there for us and we're trying to figure out, does being add something or not? Perhaps being cannot be so conveniently shoved aside as the discussion of the copula seems to have succeeded in doing. Even when it is established, I'm going to go out on a limb here, this is not precise, okay? But you know, you can chase nature out the door with a pitchfork and nevertheless it returns. Okay, you can chase being out the door with a pitchfork, thinking that you've rejected it as empty, as indeterminate, as a copula, as linguistic hypnosis, as this or that. Nevertheless, it returns. It's there. We have to think it through. 
Even when it is established that man knows nothing of being and all his experiences and dealings with beings, I have my cup, I have my paper, I have my computer, I have my camera, I have my microphone. I don't have being. So even when it is established that man knows nothing of being in all his experiences and dealings with beings, indeed that he needs to know nothing of being, you can operate perfectly fine without ever having thought about ontology, apparently, then it is still by no means decided whether what he experiences before all beings experiences differently and more originarily than all, than any particular being is what we call being. The remark that the word is means only an empty representation of something indeterminate and is not further determinable can no longer suffice to decide what being is apart from beings. So you sort of see the pattern. We're always left with the question. There's always something that remains that hasn't been pushed aside. We've tried to push it aside hasn't worked. We've tried to answer it. The answers have been insufficient. Meanwhile, we've only given voice to the undeniable fact, Heidegger continues, that the immediate experience of beings holds beings secure and therein finds contentment. One finds proof of actuality in the actual itself, equates the one, the actual with the other, the actuality. Like, go be in reality. Go be with things. Like, just stop talking about philosophy, right? Go touch grass or whatever, go be with the actual, and then you'll be in the realm of actuality. You seem seemingly uh, everything's fine. In one case, one concedes the proper essence to actuality. It is the role of capturing the universal representation of the most universal. So what is being, what does it mean to say that anything is? It means to say that it's actual. But we already saw at the beginning of this whole section, actuality, possibility, necessity, there's more to the story. So Heidegger's, he's given us leeway here. We have to take advantage of it. He's given us some slack. We have to pull the rope. Okay, uh, where are we here? One is content with beings, aren't we? And renounces being so decisively that one does not allow this renunciation to count as such, as a renunciation, as something lost, but declares it to be a gain. We've, you know, declares it to be a gain. In renouncing the empty talk of being, we seemingly have gained reality. The advantage from now on of not being disturbed by the abstract in dealing with beings. Okay, and now Heidegger asks, where does this remarkable contentment come from? Why are we content? Why do we believe we've gained when we reject being as abstract? We believe we've rejected the abstract and in doing so have gained the real, the actual, the here and now, the present, that which truly concerns us. And yet we seemingly have chopped off something that permeates our speaking and our thinking and our comportment, whether we pay attention to it or not. Where does this remarkable contentment come from? The contentment of the rejection of the seemingly abstract. Perhaps this complacency about the experience and cultivation of beings stems from the fact that man in the midst of beings, are you not in the midst of beings? Look around you, right? You're man in the midst of beings. So perhaps this complacency about the experience and cultivation of beings stems from the fact that man in the midst of beings thinks only about what he needs. Remember the introduction, what we need and what we can do without. Why should he need a discussion of the meaning of the word is? Great question. I've been asked that many times by people that I discuss Heidegger with. Why do I need a discussion about the meaning of the word is? Why can't I just change the tire, you know, or fix, you know what I'm saying? Do something actually effective here and now. Indeed, Heidegger concedes, or says, it is of no use. Discussions about the is in the proposition, therefore, also remain useless, even if it should turn out that we're not dealing with mere words and mere verbal meanings. This reflection is devoted to something superfluous, and perhaps even to an excess. You don't need to know the meaning of being, in the sense that you need to satisfy some need. For this reason alone, we do not prematurely cast aside discussions of the is and the proposition. Perhaps something essential conceals itself here, especially if everything essential occurs, despite all that is non-essential. Everything decisive is despite the ordinary, for the ordinary and usual recognizes and wants only its own kind. Okay, you guys see here, right? We're not just dealing with the actual and the effective. We're going beyond it. Why are we going beyond it? Because as we saw from the introduction, we're sort of being called forth, something is compelling to us, we're starting to see a perplexity, we recognize that this word is in all of the things that we say, that it has a certain sort of richness, and some people will be turned off by that, 
they'll get lost in this discussion. Other people will be attracted by that and they'll get pulled beyond the realm of need into the realm of what we can do without into the realm, as it were, of the essential. Perhaps Heidegger says here in the last paragraph of this section, the previous discussion of the is, where the is is understood as the copula, was only an ordinary discussion made ordinary by our long being accustomed to thinking of so-called grammar as appropriate for imparting authoritative information about language and the word. Like, oh, I want to know about language. I turn to the authoritative study of language. I turn to grammar. And maybe that's what people think they're doing when they answer what is being and why should I care about it as saying it's a copula and it links nouns and whatever. Perhaps the ordinary, though, must first be shaken so that we receive a first sense of the superfluous. Okay, Heidegger knows what it's like for us normally, but perhaps that ordinary attitude must first be shaken so that we can receive a first sense of the superfluous, of that which we can do without, of the essential, uh, as described in the earlier uh, lecture on the introduction. Thus, forsaking the beaten path of former opinion, which says being is just this copula and we can treat it in grammar, we wish to take up anew, once again returning to the question, the discussion of the is and being. So Heidegger has taken us on this little circuitous, circuitous journey, this path, He's moved us through the emptiness of the is. He's looked at these various sentences. He's seen the richness. He said the richness derives from the beings. And if so, then it really is just a copula. And if it's just a copula, then it actually is empty. And if it's empty, we can reject it. And if we reject it, we've gotten rid of the abstract. Therefore, we can dial into the concrete. And the way you dial into the concrete is through working and fighting, through the soldier, through the man who matches the world as will to power. But the man who matches the world as will to power doesn't necessarily see the world as will to power. So we have the question of being back on the table. We see grammar couldn't answer it. Our ordinary reflections didn't get far enough. And therefore, to repeat, we wish to take up anew the discussion of the is and being. Heidegger is going to take us further into the origins of this question, deeper into the constitution of this question, okay? Away from our ordinary uh, stupor or whatever it happens to be. So what comes next in the book, just to show you, and Heidegger does this often in his lectures, is a recapitulation. A recapitulation is a restatement of the arguments that he's made so far, of the reflections that he's given us, the meditations and considerations. And sometimes they add something, sometimes they don't. We've been doing some recapitulations along the way. I don't think I'm going to read this out. Let me just take a quick glance at it here. I think pretty much we've accomplished the recapitulation ourselves. Not so badly. Let's just see how he ends this particular section. Um, yeah, we can, I would say, leave it there without the recapitulation. So what have we been reading on this live stream is the first division of this basic concepts. In a previous live stream, oops, sorry. In a previous live stream, I read and commented on the introduction. Now we've read and commented on the first division, minus the recapitulation, because I think we already gave one uh, adequately along the way. And I'm not going to do this now, but I'm going to show you that the second division, uh, da -da 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 -da, guide words for reflection upon being, starting with being is the emptiest and at the same time a surplus. Heidegger is going to lead us through a meditation on the various guide words for reflecting upon being until he can get us closer and closer to the breakthrough on which somehow the understanding of his philosophy uh, depends. So that's it for my presentation. Now I just want to sit back for a minute. I take a sip of water, a sip of coffee, and uh, see how everybody's doing. Thanks again for being here. You know, I think Heidegger is important and comprehensible, even though he's difficult. So there are three courses on Heidegger in my school, millermanschool.com, one on being in time, one on contributions to philosophy of the event, and an introduction to Heidegger through the Black Notebooks. Uh, but I also have lectures here, including today's, all designed to give you some foothold in understanding Heidegger because you need some familiarity with Heidegger, not only because there's something thrilling about the essential transformation of the human being, not only because somehow it belongs to the highest possibilities of human existence to make the breakthrough that Heidegger is inviting us to make here, but on a simpler, more prosaic level, it's going to be hard to understand many other authors that you're interested in if they've all read 
and studied Heidegger and apply his categories, concepts, and modes of argumentation and all of that, I don't want you to be lost as you do that. It's super valuable to have a grounding in Heidegger if you're reading sometimes what came after, but also sometimes what came before. So that's why I have both these expositions and other lectures and paid courses on Heidegger. I think it's important. So that's why we're discussing it. Uh, again, if you've enjoyed this, please like the video, share, subscribe, comment, and so on. Uh, looking at some of the comments here, Michael, good to see you. Uh, appreciate that. I do my best to make them understandable. Again, my belief is that Heidegger is comprehensible despite his reputation for obscurantism, but that it takes uh, takes some patience, takes some work and blood, sweat and tears and all of that. Uh, Kevin on YouTube notification. I'm sorry to hear that they didn't send it. I do these live streams more or less spontaneously to tell you the truth. So I scheduled it for about two minutes after I got the idea of doing it. Maybe there's just a delay in my streaming program as well for the notifications coming out. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, Michael writes here, what Heidegger book? Oh, I guess I can just put the comments. Boom, like that. There we go. That's something, right? What Heidegger book would I tell people who want to get acquainted with Heidegger to read? He's not the easiest to comprehend. Hmm. I read a lot of secondary literature on Heidegger when I was working on my dissertation, which came out as the book called The Beginning with Heidegger. And some of it I found to be pretty helpful. Like I think there was a Cambridge companion to Being in Time where the first chapter is a summary statement, compressed and condensed of Being in Time. That was pretty good. There's a book that I like by uh, Michael Gillespie called Heidegger, Hegel, and the Ground of History or Hegel, Heidegger, and the Ground of History. There's a guy named Richard Polt who I think writes well about Heidegger and there are some other people like that who uh, who write well about him and they don't always agree with one another when they make sense of him and all of that. But ultimately and eventually, there's got to be some breakthrough into the primary sources and there are different entry points, you know? Maybe it's gonna be, maybe it's not being in time that's gonna have it click for you. Maybe it's gonna be something else. Maybe it's this, I don't know. But uh, but I like Richard Polt, I like Michael Gillespie, and there are a lot of other competent uh, Heidegger scholars. The key question, as we saw from the introductory live stream, is not necessarily whether you know they know the German inside and out and they've read the collective works of, works of Schopenhauer or whatever, but are they on, enough on Heidegger's wavelength that they can find different ways of bringing to light um, his his main, you know, how could you put it? His main points, they could well, bring you into the realm of his questioning effectively. Because once you're there, then it becomes easier to comprehend. There's sort of a threshold that you have to cross. And when you cross that threshold, suddenly it becomes easier. So all of the introductory sources that I would recommend, I would recommend on the basis of that, that they help you get on Heidegger's uh, wavelength. Anyways, I mentioned a few that I like. Richard Poult, Michael Gillespie, and uh, I'm sure there are others, but I just can't remember on uh, right on the spot. So Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky joke. That's my own fault because I put the picture of Bill Clinton there. Uh, go touch grass. Yeah, you know, it helps us. One of the things that I personally think is very important in grasping Heidegger, it sounds abstract. Being, beings, ontological difference is, is the meaning of is, is, beings are. And you're like, man, come on. You know, it's too much of that. But you always can directly relate it to yourself, your situation, your thinking. That's why I would say this cup, this pen, for you, it's something else. The idea that you reject the conceptual and go into effective action, everybody can understand that, I think. The idea that the effective action that matters is of such and such a kind, you know, or that when people say like, dude, get out of the conceptuality and go to the reality. Okay, what's the reality? I don't know, go to a martial arts class and get punched in the face. How's that for reality? Okay, but is that... Does that give you more access to what Heidegger is trying to get us to think about? You know, so all that Heidegger says, in my view, we can replicate with ourselves. We can run it through our own direct experience, reproduce it. Like in Descartes' meditations, you don't just read his meditation, you also perform his meditation. Same with Heidegger in some sense. You don't just read his considerations, you perform his considerations. In my view, in my view, that's a helpful way of approaching it. So once again, I want to thank everybody who 
spent uh, their time here on this live stream. I hope you enjoyed it. Really, we're just going over Heidegger's book. I guess I'm going to continue it. We're this far into it. We might as well. I'm not going to do it now, but I'll have another live stream where we take up the next section. Is Heidegger a better thinker than Nietzsche? That's a good and interesting question. Each of them obviously has made the profoundest breakthrough into uh, the realm, the configuration of the world. Uh, I leave that an open question because the relationship between Heidegger and Nietzsche, and as you know, for me, the importance of Leo Strauss, Strauss's take on Heidegger, Strauss's take on Nietzsche, as we triangulate between Strauss, Heidegger, and Nietzsche, uh, we can only profit from that type of exercise. Shout out to Toronto boys. Uh, okay, all right, listen. Thank you very much. Like, share, subscribe, millermanschool.com. See you in the next live stream and good luck with your Heidegger readings. Bye.